Hello, everyone. I'm Alessandra. I am a CSPC volunteer with the editorial committee. So if you were here yesterday, you may know that we have a magazine and that we're very proud of it. Um, we acknowledge that the CSBC is taking place on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, whose presence reaches back to time immemorial. And we thank them for allowing us to be here on their land. I'm excited to introduce this panel on federal and academic science partnerships organized by the Canadian Nuclear Laboratories. It's going to be a very exciting conversation, I assume. And Part of that exciting conversation is bringing it over to Twitter. So if you do tweet about this panel or any other panel at the conference, make sure to tag at science policy and also use the hashtag CSBC 2022. We also have a survey on the app that allows us to improve the next science policy conference. So if you have the time, do please take that so we can make 2023 even better. So. Thank you, and over to Kara. Bonjour tout le monde et bienvenue. Ça va être une session bilingue, alors je vous invite à vous exprimer dans la langue de votre choix. Welcome everybody. My name is Kara Tannenbaum. I'm the Departmental Science Advisor for Health Canada and also Scientific Director of the Institute of Gender and Health at the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. So I have one foot in academia and I have one foot in the federal uh, science ecosystem. Uh, thank you, Alexandra, for acknowledging that we're on the lands of the Anishinaabe. And as I take my steps towards reconciliation, there's something that I've learned from my Indigenous scholar colleagues, and that's about the importance of being in good relations. And I think that that's a really important theme today as we talk about federal science and academic science. How do we put the, the, the two of those in good relations as well as in good relations with the, with the environment and the ecosystem in which we all live? Today's gonna to be about breaking down silos. A lot of our world has become siloed, siloed on Zoom, siloed in different echo chambers, siloed in this setting versus that setting, both physically and virtually. And we're gonna be looking to you to give us ideas during the question and answer session on what's worked for you and what ideas you have to make that better. And we have a poll that we'd like you to fill out, but if you don't mind, before we introduce ourselves, I'm kind of curious who's in the room with us. Are you curious who's in the room with us? All right, so we won't go around and have everybody introduce themselves because, well, that wouldn't work. Um, let's see, can you raise your hand if you self-identify as someone who is or has been in the academic science setting? Okay, we have a lot of academics. Now, can you raise your hand if you self-identify as someone who is or has been in the federal science ecosystem? Wow, okay, so now raise your hand if you raised your hand both times. Oh, okay, so this is wonderful. I feel like we're kind of two-eyed seeing in, in a way, so you have good knowledge of both sides of the equation, and I think we're gonna have a really fulsome discussion. So thank you to Josh for getting us organized today, and I think that we are ready to introduce our panelists, and what I'd like to do maybe is to invite you to open the app, um, if you click on the session, you'll see on top it says uh, polls and question and answer. You could either do it there. As you see, I'm not scared to just be interactive in person. We are in person af after all. Like it's kind of weird to be doing stuff virtually if we're in person. But I invite you to choose what, however you'd like to express yourself. And why don't we ask you to introduce yourselves? So let's start with Jeff. Jeff Griffin. Okay, uh, thank you. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, thanks, Kara. Uh, so my name is Jeff Griffin. I'm the Vice President for Science and Technology at Canadian Nuclear Laboratories, or CNL. Uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with CNL, it is actually the, uh, it's the private, um, I guess, uh, private sector corporation that operates what historically has been known as uh, uh, Chalk River Laboratories. 
uh, but we operate it now under the uh, uh, oversight of AECL, Atomic Energy of Canada Limited. So we're continuing to do uh, nuclear research, building on 70-year legacy of the Chalk River Laboratories, uh, doing research in uh, nuclear uh, science and engineering, medical radioisotopes, uh, clean energy, hydrogen, um, things of that nature, uh, material science. Uh, we're, through the investments of the Canadian government, we're building uh, fantastic new facilities to help uh, carry this national laboratory into the future. And part of that, and I think a really important part of that that we want to talk about today is how we as a federal laboratory can work in, uh, closely with academia. So I'm really excited about this session. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Shannon Quinn, would you like to introduce yourself? Merci, Cara. Je m'appelle Shannon Quinn. Je travaille pour le Conseil national de recherche du Canada et je suis la secrétaire générale. So many of you would know the National Research Council. We operate 24 laboratories in all 10 provinces. And we are the federal organization that works very closely from a research perspective with both academia and industry because we really have a focus on enabling uh, commercialization of research. And that is a, a focus and it's one of our main mandates. Uh, we also have uh, two other broad areas. Uh, we do science in order to inform science-based policy decision-making within the federal system. Uh, and we do science broadly to generate new knowledge uh, that has unknown, but certainly benefits go forward. Great. Um, Duncan Retson, over to you. Thanks, Kara. So my name is Duncan Retson. Uh, je suis sous-ministre joint délégué du uh, service uh, provisionnement et no, Service Public Approvisionnement Canada, c'est bien ça. So that's Public Services and Procurement Canada, and you may wonder why we're here. We're here because we help take care of a lot of the federal infrastructure inside the federal family. And about five years ago, um, a program called, um, regrettably named FISTI, and rebranded as Labs Canada, uh, was created and brought into our department to work with, uh, in the first phase, 15 federal science departments and agencies to help them reimagine uh, what, in the first phase, failing infrastructure could look like if reconstituted in a collaborative way um, to serve people well into the 21st century. So we're a few years uh, into that journey now and um, really happy to be here. Thanks. Merci. Guy Lebec, je vous invite à vous présenter. Merci, Cara. Guy Lebec, je suis le vice-recteur associé à l'innovation partenariat et entrepreneuriat à l'Université d'Ottawa. Uh, I'm one of those two seeing persons that uh, Kara asked about uh, at the outset, where I've spent my career jumping between academia and uh, research granting uh, agencies. So I think I'm going to be able to share a little bit of uh, insights as to what's uh, happening at the university in terms of uh, successful academic federal partnerships and by magic, I will have some stories about uh, Canadian Nuclear Labs, the ECL, and the NRC. Thank you. COVID really changed things, didn't it? I would say that it accelerated many of our visions for what partnership and collaboration might look like between the feds and the academics and industry. I'm going to throw in industry there and, and many, many others. Um, did we learn lessons that we could take forward to other spheres? Or was that, a, is it, I'm not sure it's over, is it a moment in time or are we having real world learning? And this is especially true for the science and technology sectors. So maybe my first question would be, um, you know, let me start with, I don't know, Jeff and Shannon. You know, how did your organizations contribute to Canada's COVID response? And did collaboration with universities help you deliver? Who wants to start, Shannon? Sure, thank you very much. Um, so like many of us and uh, many of our organizations, uh, we really did rise to the challenge when called upon to, to address the pandemic when it presented itself. And people did it very, very rapidly, and that was true for the NRC as well. And what I'll say is, is that in our response, what made it both effective and rapid 
was the existence of very strong partnerships and collaborations with universities, yes, also uh, with other partners across the federal system and with the private sector. And that's what allowed the kind of mobilization on the time frames that we saw during the pandemic. And so it speaks to um, not only the advantage of the, the collaboration in terms of the outcomes of the specific projects that you have, but the value of maintaining a broad network of relationships and partnerships so that you can pivot, so that you can react rapidly and have all of the ties that you need in order to do that effectively. Um, so at the NRC, we, we really put our response in four categories, um, infrastructure, uh, training, research, and advice. Um, and all of these, uh, both academic and uh, private sector partnerships played a, a vital role. Uh, so from an infrastructure point of view, the NRC was called upon to build the Biologics Manufacturing Center um, in, in order to have domestic capacity to produce vaccines. Um, and uh, of course, uh, we needed it as rapidly as possible. The Biologics Manufacturing Center, the physical structure itself was uh, built in about 10 months. Um, it was fitted up and equipped in about 18 months, and within about two years, it had its uh, licensing of a, as a drug establishment license from Health Canada. Um, and what allowed these exceptional timelines was the fact that we had people inside the NRC who were very well connected with the industry and the sector, both academic and business, and so you could bring those people in almost instantly to help get started to do the planning, to do the execution, and have everyone pulling together. Um, and then on some of the other fronts, on the research front, for example, um, our Pandemic Response Challenge Program, uh, which was a program specifically designed to uh, call in and fund programs that would have academic, federal, uh, and business partners all in one project uh, was stood up uh, in a matter of weeks because of the fact that in 2018, the NRC established this challenge program platform uh, for this very purpose in other targeted sectors. But because the platforms existed, because the mechanisms by which to work with academia and industry existed, uh, when called upon to just do the same, but in uh, a pandemic focus, everything was in place to do it very rapidly. And the same was true uh, on the, the training and advice fronts. Thank you, Shannon. Jeff, do you wanna share some experiences and lessons learned? Sure, uh, excuse me. Um, at CNL, in fact, I was just coming on board at CNL at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and like a lot of other organizations, uh, we were uh, you know, searching for ways to actually contribute the, the knowledge, the capability, the experience we have. And uh, at that time, uh, Dr. Art McDonald, the Nobel laureate, uh, at this at Queens, um, uh, reached out to CNL, uh, Triumph, um, Snow Lab and international partners to, to contemplate how to put together uh, a consortium that could actually uh, make ventilators. You recall at the beginning of the pandemic, that was a huge concern for everyone. Would there be enough ventilators and uh, not just for Canada, but even eventually for the world as uh, COVID was spreading around. Uh, and so we actually created a team with a blessing from AECL. We were part of that team. And to me, it was just a fabulous uh, uh, example of how you bring uh, people together, uh, capabilities together to accomplish something. Because in a very short period of time, a matter of uh, weeks and months, uh, we developed, uh, jointly developed, and were able to, to process it all the way through to manufacturing uh, an open source, cheap, uh, you know, simple ventilator design that could be manufactured easily and quickly and uh, received uh, uh, Health Canada approval. So um, I, I'm sure many of you are familiar with that story, but to me, it's sort of the key thing coming out of that is sort of the lessons that, you know, what does that illustrate for us? Well, it illustrates that there's a tremendous uh, uh, value in, in a common cause. 
a common goal, a uh, common objective, and so that's really sort of a key to, I think, effective collaborations. And then there's the strength in the collaborations where there's, uh, where you have complementary skills. Uh, you know, things that uh, one organization like CNL brought in, uh, I think uh, integrated, uh, the ability to integrate systems, to work, uh, to troubleshoot those systems, to deal with cyber issues. Uh, we had uh, uh, the procurement, the, uh, tools that perhaps some other labs didn't have because of our size. Uh, so all those things kind of came together and really uh, provided, I think, a, an effective uh, path, uh, path forward. So to me, it was a, a great example. Um, and it really, you know, was brought together by the circumstances, of course. Uh, but it's something that we can look back at and say, okay, what does that tell us about how we should be moving forward and, and what we should be looking for as we try to build collaborations for the future? Thanks, Jeff. So I don't know if we could get the first poll question up on the screen. Um, I'll read it out to you for those of you who haven't. I don't know if we could get it. Can we get the first poll question up on the screen for you? Oh, good. Oh, okay. I can see it from here. All right. Well, uh, so you could see it. So the question was, um, you know, initiating, uh, sorry. Yep. The, uh, which challenge area do you think could benefit most from these lessons learned? And from here, it looks to me like people are still putting in their answers. We could also do a show of hands. So does anyone think that the lessons that you heard here would be most applicable to climate change mitigation strategies? You could put up your hand for those of you who didn't do it online. And I think that's actually the leading one. What about sustainable food systems? Is this somewhere where we need good relationships? Anyone? Yes, okay, less so. Human health. And that's number second. And then cybersecurity. Okay, so I think that we're talking about human health, climate change mitigation. There's no reason why we can't apply these lessons both in times of crisis. I think, Jeff, your ventilator example almost brought tears to my eyes, actually. You took me back to the pandemic. I'm actually a, a physician and worked in long-term care and thinking about the shortages of you know, PPE and ventilators. And then I got hit by a tornado this summer, so thinking about the lack of generators. And then what about the flooding in the Atlantic provinces where there was lack of baby formula and how do we get it there, and then of course the breaches of security. So these are real things happening to us in real time, where we're having a bit of an academic discussion, but there is urgency to all of it, and being in good relations I think is, is gonna be key, and let's see what others have to say about that. Now, ce n'est pas, pas facile de collaborer. Hein? Tout le monde aime ses, ses propres travaux. travaux. Euh, moi, je veux occuper de moi-même. Les choses que moi, je fais, ce sont les plus importantes. C'est quoi les incitatifs pour collaborer avec quelqu'un d'autre? Ça prend du temps, ça prend du travail. They're, you know, it's not that easy. I'm just going to be, you know, thank you for smiling. You're, you're acknowledging that it sounds good, but it's harder to put into practice. So there are barriers, and it, it takes work. Um, you know, Duncan, uh, Guy, uh, is it true that, you know, function follows form? If we had the correct infrastructure, would it make it easier? Or are there other barriers that need to be overcome to address some of those challenges in collaborating? Or is it purely psychological and egotistical? Um, kind of curious. Duncan, what do you think? Thanks, Kara. Um, so I'm going to tell two stories, and I'm going to leave the organizations nameless so that, that nobody, uh, nobody feels bad because we are talking about relationships. Um, both are the same story, really. So one was a case where there was a federal research lab that was located on a university campus, and there was a research program going on there. Uh, in fact, there were two. There were two labs that were located on university campus across the street from each other. And uh, I had the privilege to do a tour of both of these facilities uh, to understand what they did and to think about how could collaboration take place better. And the uh, investigators working in both joined for the tour of each, uh, most of them meeting each other for the first time. And somebody from the university was there uh, and they expressed uh, the research facility as the place that had a lobby that you could go into and see a commissionaire, but that was it. So 
um, that university's notion of collaboration was the facility was located on a campus, but it was basically kind of a fortress. Um, another case was uh, a major um, good-sized research institution on a different university campus, a completely different area, uh, had a chance to go through, tour, meet, understand the program and the nature of the work, and uh, ask the question, so did you do a lot of work with um, the grad students who work, who study in an area exactly like the work that you're doing? And the answer that came back was, well, we used to, but we really haven't done very much since the 90s. Oh, since the 90s, why is that? Well, you know, there's a lot of students and there's a lot of, you know, security policies and some are foreign students. And by the time you get the security clearance through, the students aren't here anymore. So it just became sort of too much of a problem to do it. So like occasionally, but honestly, not that much. So there are physical design to facilities that can uh, inhibit or promote collaboration. But I think a lot of it actually is, is less about ego and um, in terms of a pure barrier is less about architecture. Architecture can do an amazing job at helping drive collaboration. It, it's less about it being the principal barrier in my view. I think the principal barrier, and I say this as, a, as an unrepentant fed, um, is the institution and the institutionalization we have many, many rules, and those rules are all independently there for very good reasons to make sure that we do things very well and right and proper. But when you start to overlay them all on top of each other, it becomes very hard sometimes to work across these, these um, silos that are essentially a construct of the Westminster model of government. So one of the things that we're trying to do in our program, we have a mandate to go through, look at some of these, and see where, there's, uh, where there are opportunities to streamline or to put in place um, approaches that get some of these barriers, the administrative ones, out of the way, because those are the ones that kind of suck the soul out of the researcher who might really want to collaborate, but like how many forms do I have to fill out and how many months or years will it take me to do it? Those are, those are almost harder than, um, you know, than, than getting someone a key to, uh, to the locked door. Guy, would you partage your reflections on this experience? Oui, merci, Kara. So the title of this panel is Success Through Partnerships. Uh, I won't be making any big revelations or giving you big secrets away on how things are working at the University of Ottawa uh, or universities in general. Um, but the word partnership involves uh, an exchange uh, and a collaboration and two people or two groups or two entities being together. Um, one of the challenges we have, uh, Duncan talked about institutionalization, um, is that too often we don't know each other well enough. And one of the challenges we have, uh, and one of the first questions I asked myself when I joined the university uh, literally four years to the day, is um, if we want to thrive in Ottawa, what do I need to know? What do I need to be aware of? And what are the local advantages, the local assets, the local attributes that I can rely on, connect to, so that together we can be stronger. So I'll bring you back to uh, your grade nine or 10 evolution and ecology course about thriving and survival of the fittest. And it really is about uh, being aware of your surroundings. Proximity counts in so many, so many uh, avenues. And we all know that uh, COVID has shown that proximity uh, is so critical and, and uh, we've missed so many opportunities because of that lack of proximity over the last few years. So my job at the university when I started was to figure out, okay, what's around me? What's the Ottawa advantage? What's the local advantage? So I look around me, there's the seat of power, federal government, policy, law, decision-making, budget-making, 120,000 public servants. We have students, highly skilled students that are going to become major contributors to the workforce, both in the public service, but also just 25 kilometers to the west of Ottawa is Canada's largest technology park in Canada North, where Nortel was and all of its offshoots have thrived over the last uh, 20, 30 years. You know, 380, close to 400 high-tech companies, 27 or 20, actually 33,000 people working in that park. We've got 65 different federal research labs operating in and around the city of Ottawa. 
we have a hundred or so science and technology counselors from embassies located all around the, the city. I see one of them over there. They're all about partnerships. So if I'm in Ottawa, I'm going to work with the federal government research labs. I'm going to work with federal museums. I'm going to work with SMT counselors in embassies. I'm going to work with other institutions. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. So we were very fortunate at the university to have a really good uh, uh, outcome for the 2020 Innovation Fund for the Canada Foundation for Innovation. And the secret to our success was collaborating with the NRC and with Health Canada on two projects, one on bringing the regulatory and um, policy-making uh, arm of Health Canada around heat, heat stress and taking advantage of our leading research on uh, heat uh, stress and heat metabolism. The other one, of course, is we've developed a bit of a uh, reputation for photonics, ultra-fast laser spectroscopy, quantum over the last 20 years. And so we brought the Max Planck uh, International Joint Lab a few years ago to Ottawa, one of only two or three in the country. And we uh, signed a fantastic uh, partnership, the Joint Center for Extreme Photonics with the NRC uh, just a few years ago. So it's really about finding those connections where we have a shared uh, vision and a shared purpose and a shared intention to solve some pretty neat uh, challenges. And it's in STEM, but it's also with Justice Canada, with libraries and archives. So it really spans across the whole institution for, for us. But we're also there to contribute, contribute students, contribute thought leadership. So when we talk about partnerships, we have this typical construct that it's about uh, Professor A and government scientist B working together, doing a joint project, and off they go. And that's been happening for 20 years, so there's been lots of partnership happening. In my role, it's about adding that layer of partnership that is much more strategic or institutional that helps build stronger ties and longer, uh, longer ties with, uh, with our partners so that we can work uh, in a five to 10 year time frame as opposed to a project time frame. And as Duncan was saying, um, we may be working on very similar projects and sim similar challenges, but we work very differently in academia and the federal government. So understanding that, recognizing those differences allows us to uh, kind of figure out what our purpose and what our mission is and what our perspective and contribution is in, the, in those partnerships. And so whether it's Health Canada, the NRC, Libraries and Archives Canada, uh, I can, and I can go on, um, we really are focusing on uh, bringing our very best assets to the table and marrying them to, uh, to the assets that, uh, that are in our local uh, environment and really uh, becoming a, a much stronger uh, S&T community uh, in, in Ottawa. And at the end of the day, uh, it creates really good students, a really good workforce, and really strong ties. Thanks for those examples. Um, Duncan, we're struggling with the same thing at Health Canada right now because of the increased um, you know, rigor and strictness around research security. Our postdocs and students to work in our labs are not getting their security clearance fast enough to get into the labs, and maybe we could be inspired by French grammar. My, my son pointed this out to me. He said, you know, Mom, there's a lot of rules, but, you know, there's also a lot of exceptions, and, and maybe we need some work around agreements that we could share among the different institutions. So I like how you focused on the opportunities. Maybe we shouldn't use the word barriers. Maybe we should be optimistic. Let, let's think about enablers. And poll question number two, if we could get it up on the screen, is about what you think the most significant enablers are for creating impactful research partnerships. Do you think it's A, shared infrastructure and advanced technology? 25, 26% said that. Do you think it's shared expertise and interdisciplinarity? We didn't talk a lot about interdisciplinarity, but I see that our audience thinks that that's very, very important. So bringing different perspectives and complementary skills seems to be a good driver. What about knowledge mobilization capabilities? 
or tested IP frameworks. It looks like IP frameworks are important, but maybe not the primary enabler if you don't have the people, the knowledge, the interdisciplinarity, and um, the shared expertise. All right, uh, so building on, on what you said, uh, Duncan and Guy, I'm wondering if there are also aspects of our science and technology ecosystem that, um, you know, have gotten in the way uh, and you've already found solutions to them because we heard a little bit about the, the barriers, but maybe you already have some solutions to them. I don't know. Uh, Shannon? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we often talk about, talk about everything as an opportunity. I mean, there are barriers. <laughs> there are real barriers and I think uh, Many of us here uh, likely have experienced them, especially people who have uh, kind of worked on both sides of the federal system and academia. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll point out two um, and then talk about um, some of the ways in which the NRC has tackled them or is tackling them. Um, so, so one of them is, is just a process. I would say, um, I'll tell a little story too and not naming any institutions, but when I was, um, uh, when I first came into government, it was a little bit on the notion that uh, because I had uh, worked in the private sector, I had worked in academia and was coming into government, uh, that I might be useful in contributing to setting up a, a program that was specifically designed to bring in researchers from all of those uh, parts of the ecosystem. Um, and I was excited to do that. And then when I got in there, um, I went to, to try to set up some projects. And then they told me, well, well, actually, you can't do that because the money that you have can only be given out to, um, to uh, business partners. Uh, and so they were basically explaining to me that uh, color of muddy matters in government. And while the program was well-funded, the color of money that I had was for industrial partnerships. I had no money for federal researchers. I had no money for academic researchers. And this is uh, entirely common across the system that we set up programs that are targeted at academics or we set up programs that are targeted at business or we set up programs that are targeted um, at, at internal research. Uh, so one of the things that uh, I've already referenced is the NRC back in 2018 set up these uh, system of challenge programs. Um, and one of the things that was unique about it was that it was specifically designed to have within the one program funding that um, would uh, be able to fund both business partners, academic partners, and federal partners. Um, and so it was properly set up that you could attract and indeed was targeted at those kinds of projects that would have all three partnerships within them. Um, so that's one example of uh, one of the things that's sort of inherent in the federal system that stands um, often to be a barrier. Uh, but if you're kind of thoughtful, you can, you can build workarounds. So I'm, I'm holding up the NRC's challenge programs as, as one of the ways or an example of the way that you can build around those barriers. One of the other things that we've experienced uh, at the NRC is um, um, setting up collaboration centers where you co-locate um, federal researchers on um, university campuses. And we've already heard that uh, sometimes that works uh, and sometimes that doesn't. And it has been the experience at the NRC too. Um, but maybe I'll focus on where we see success in these areas is where people really actually exploit the differences between the two sectors. So as federal researchers, uh, we work on and can work on very long timelines. So at the NRC, we can set up deliberately um, programs and research projects that are going to look out decades and we can staff them with people who will be around potentially for decades, and we can staff them 
with people who come from a number of different disciplines um, and bring a number of different skill sets. In academia, they have the advantage that you have students, you have fresh talent, uh, there's a continuous cycle, you get fresh eyes, you get enthusiasm, uh, and you get um, exceptional expertise uh, um, from the, the faculty members themselves. And if you set up your projects that you take advantage of the fact that there's difference in time scales in the two, then it works. Where you don't actually take that into account when you're setting it up, it often doesn't work. Uh, where both sides are setting up activities and goals that are on different time frames and they don't line up and they don't see how they can collaborate. But when you, when you actually try to marry the two together so that you take advantage of the different time scales, that's where we've really seen it work. So those are good examples. Duncan? So you asked about um, interdisciplinarity and it, you know, we hadn't said much about that, but now you're, now you're definitely getting into it. So I'll, I'll pick up that ball as well. The examples that we've seen that have worked quite well um, in our case are where different people have come together. So, so our program is about bringing different, uh, different people together from different research fields, but also um, crossing institutional barriers. So we have some examples where we work uh, where, where the researchers we're working with federally are working with uh, academic partners as well. And we envision in future phases that will expand probably to other, other sectors as well, consistent with the original policy intent of the program. And the examples where we've seen where there have been barriers that have been broken, um, one example would be uh, actually early in the pandemic, um, Public Health Agency of Canada was, as everyone in the room here knows or can imagine, was rather busy. Um, it, was, it was an exceptionally busy time for them. So they didn't have a lot of time to be, it was all hands, and they didn't have a lot of time to be fussing about with some of the infrastructure pieces. But one of those infrastructure pieces um, was a secure bioinformatics network that would allow them to scale up um, sharing of lots, of lots and lots of data with different partners all across the country who could be involved in a national testing and sort of surveillance program to generate early intelligence. So our team um, had a, has a small IT capability and we were able to work with Public Health Agency of Canada who did not have the time but had the requirement uh, and some of their partners to put in place in, in the course of about six weeks um, a national secure um, uh, information network that allowed them to gather a lot of information very quickly. So we brought some of the IT skills that we had um, to the party that, that otherwise somebody else could have done it, but those people were busy. A um, couple of other examples would be, um, if we look at some of the most creative things that we've seen in, in the early days of our program, it's where the program exists not just to fix an existing piece of federal failing infrastructure, but the price of admission is people have to come together and work together and do joint programming. So they still have their accountability for the thing that they needed to do, but they have to come up with a design that allows different program areas to come and work together so that um, this, this total can be greater than just the sum of the parts. So in the earliest phases where we've been doing what we, the jargon is functional programming, where people look at how they would work together and how they would create this new platform to be able to do it, um, there are creative things coming and potential arising where people aren't even located together in new facilities, but some discussions have started, we've seen amongst the science partners. Um, and that's, that's given rise to some opportunities and some possibilities. And when we look abroad at, at other institutions that have done this and are sort of further down this road, um, we see consistently that there, is, there are many sectors and many disciplines that are all working together in the same space and place with the right equipment and right digital platforms to allow them to accomplish the things they are. So transdisciplinarity or, or interdisciplinary work is in fact one of the main keys when people do to pick up on, on, uh, on, on, on the, the, the language that's already been put out there. When you've got a marriage of these different things coming together, when it's for right and good reasons that people can see and understand 
and they want to pursue, it makes sense to them, they see the value in it, that's where it really gets exciting. So it, it gives the impetus to push through some of the barriers with hopefully there being some supporting programs or infrastructure out there to help minimize or knock down some of the other ones. Let's put up the next poll question. Um, the way it's phrased is, which barrier to research collaboration is the most difficult to overcome? Uh, the majority seem to think it's financial, and that may come back to the point that you made earlier about the research is either supposed to be for industry, or it's supposed to be for scientists, or it's supposed to be for federal programs, or maybe it just means there's not enough money to set up these collabor and maintain the relationships that you need for platforms and partnerships human resources and shared infrastructure, large physical distance. No one thought that was too much of a barrier after COVID. Um, inventory of assets. You know, Duncan, the example that you just gave is the Public Health Agency of Canada needed something and you had it. How did you know that they needed it and how did they know that you had it? So inventory of assets, I think, is something that maybe we could do better at. And then process and bureaucracy uh, is really, we're looking for people with tenacity and persistence to find the workarounds to some of those barriers, but also maybe the forum where um, we can hear from the parties who want to partner on where the barriers are. Is, is there a forum for expression of what some of those barriers are and the willingness and problem solvers to, to get rid of some of those barriers. So process can be um, your enemy or process can be your friend if you use it properly. All right, another question. So it's clear that science and technology partnerships are critical to addressing Canada's social and economic challenges. And I think that our panelists have really shared some excellent examples. And I thank you actually for being so forthcoming and also for maintaining confidentiality. But being vulnerable in the sense that this is no surprise to anyone, but we're, we're not perfect. We're, we're very imperfect, but we're always trying to get better. Um, so you could have a partnership, or and, and I forget who it was. Uh, was it was it Duncan? One of your first examples when you walked into the building and there was the office of partnership at the university, but it was just you know a booth and you didn't actually find the partnerships there. So how, how about effective partnerships? We talked about partnerships, but not all partnerships are effective. So I'm gonna dig a little deeper here and maybe ask, I don't know who hasn't spoken, Jeff and, and maybe Guy, can you tell us your thoughts about, you know, what makes a partnership effective? And what part, what, what do you get, what's your definition of value within a partnership? So interested in hearing your thoughts on that. Okay, sure. I'll, I'll start off. Uh, it's actually a good question and one I've spent uh, a lot of time recently trying to work through uh, and hopefully we will we'll, we'll work through that. Uh, so I come, just by way of background, I come, um, I came up to Canada uh, almost three years ago. I come from a U.S. national lab system uh, where I spent uh, more years than I want to tell uh, working at various labs and working with various labs. And um, I think one thing that's really sort of a key aspect of that, and so therefore I'm very familiar with it, is uh, it's a pretty close integration between universities and the federal laboratory system in the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, actually, I think almost every lab uh, is actually uh, partly operated under contract with a uh, laboratory part partner in the contract. So it's a very close connection. Uh, and so that's sort of something that I'm just used to seeing. And if I go back to what Shannon was talking about earlier, um, there, are, uh, there, are, there are differences, but uh, there's a lot of strength in combining the laboratories uh, like that. And so uh, in, in coming here at CNL, uh, I think what, at least initially, we have historically have had a lot, a lot of uh, relationships with universities, but there were what I would call ad hoc and I think what Guy called earlier as Professor A working with Scientist B or something along those lines. <laughs> um, and we really want to take, as, as Guy mentioned, we want to take that to a higher level. So we've been working over the last few months at CNL to sort of create what we're calling a university partnership and we're calling it a pilot program right now uh, because uh, we, we know we've got to start with a reasonable 
uh, engagement and, and got to develop the understanding. It's just as everybody around this table has been talking about for the last hour, uh, you know, how does this, uh, what is it that makes an effective partnership? And so we've actually been spending time uh, talking with universities, uh, having, I think, fairly detailed discussions uh, at the university, at our lab, bringing in uh, faculty to meet with our staff, bringing in the administration of the school, and trying to understand what is mutually, really mutually beneficial uh, into this. I mean, it's obvious that there are uh, ultimately going to be benefits uh, from the university standpoint. Uh, you know, you're, you're creating opportunities for students. Uh, there's access to facilities, uh, federal facilities, federal capabilities that uh, it's maybe not cost effective for a particular university to have. Um, there's the ability to, um, to scale, to operate in an environment that a university cannot provide, whether it's like with highly radioactive materials or, or something of that nature. Um, there's opportunity for faculty. From a, a federal laboratory perspective, obviously uh, access to talent and capabilities that we don't have, um, opportunities for our staff, uh, you know, talent pipeline is critically important. Uh, I think many industries are starting to see that. I know the nuclear industry has seen uh, a tremendous, uh, uh, you know, attrition over the last few years, and so it becomes a very big challenge to bring in new uh, new staff, to bring in staff that's excited about the challenges. Uh, and of course, it's not just nuclear. Now we, we're talking, um, you know, the whole the whole. Uh, um, challenge for Canada, uh, you know, by 2050 and, and things of that sort. So there's a lot that's in play here. And so um, for us, as we work through this, you know, we're, we're trying to find out and trying to figure out, I think, uh, how we integrate uh, the strengths, the differences. And I think, you know, Shannon's point is a really good one to exploit the differences because uh, it's not that we're looking to have exactly shared capabilities, but complementary capabilities. Uh, and figure out what the what the real benefits are for each party and all that. So, so that's what we're working through right now. We're uh, I think moving very close to having in the next uh, few weeks having some uh, formal partnerships established and really looking forward to working uh, together with um, institutions like that to help uh, you know create a, a new model for going forward for CNL and for those universities. You know how how can we work together? What can we do? Uh, a key part of that, which is another thing that's been that's been a little bit of a focus for us, is really understanding what is the infrastructure within our organization for maintaining the relationship. Uh, I think it, I think it was Yugi that said this that it, there is um, the relationships depend on its changes. Uh, discussion, uh, the ability to grow and change with uh, uh, the rest of the uh, environment. And so we, we've got to establish a, a robust uh, uh, relationship that can grow and evolve as uh, the situations around us and the needs around us change. So uh, I don't know the answer, Kara. <laughs> I know that we're working on uh, developing the answers, uh, and I think I see elements of them, but I think you know some of it is just a work in progress. Thanks, Jeff. Guy, uh, I saw you nodding your head as Jeff was speaking. Do you, do you want to amplify that or share a different perspective on what makes an effective partnership? Yeah, thanks, Kara. Um, you may have noticed that Jeff and I have been working closely for the last uh, several months. And um, when we first talked about uh, w what does the partnership look like and what are we getting out of it? Um, how are we going to co-develop it? And as Shannon said, how are we going to um, take advantage of our respective differences and make a partnership really, really flourish? So can you imagine you know, bringing fifth, I'd say it was 17 uh, professors and students on July 14th or 15th to Chalk River, right smack in the middle of the summer, to spend a day to get to know one another, to understand the operating context. I think Shannon also talked about process on how things work, the longevity, the stability that, uh, that is offered by government uh, funded uh, research programs versus the more cyclical nature of what we do uh, in academia. How do we put those strengths to bear? How do we share uh, the best of our knowledge, the best of our expertise? And how do we make those students and those relationships uh, strong? So we did that. 
uh, colleagues from CNL ACL came to uh, visit our faculty of medicine uh, a few months ago our faculty of science and we've got another delegation coming to the faculty of engineering in the uh, in the winter it takes time and then when we looked at our interactions over the past you know we didn't come like the white knight saying yeah we can build partnerships and do something strong with AECL and CNL. We've been working with AECL and CNL for 20 plus years, 25 or 26 researchers, 35 um, research projects involving a whole bunch of students, postdocs, research associates, you know, three, four million dollars worth of, uh, of activity. So now the question is, is how do we build on top of that? How do we tackle things like cybersecurity when it's very clear that there are going to be some pretty hot targets uh, across the country and critical infrastructures like a nuclear facility, uh, electricity generation, uh, power generation stations are going to be key, uh, key targets. How do we build resilience and build some um, uh, measures to help mitigate, minimize, and attenuate risks uh, and exposures that we have? While the university has some strengths to contribute to that, how do we build around ecology um, and environmental uh, matters that uh, are key and near, to, near and dear to the heart uh, of the CNL uh, science program? So it really starts with trust, goodwill, building on a track record, uh, the ability to understand and listen. You don't come in with preconceived ideas or notions or you know, what, are, what, am I, what am I going to take out of this relationship? It's what can I contribute and bring to the table? So the concept of shared infrastructure is critical. Um, we can't build infrastructures and research labs uh, all over the place that do the same thing. So maybe getting together and finding out how we can best share with just, you know, two hours up the Ottawa River, um, to do some really good things, or vice versa, two hours down the Ottawa River to come to our campus. Um, who, just stepping back to 2001 uh, for a second, who knew that 20 years later, the 900 megahertz solid state nuclear magnetic resonance that the, that, uh, the University of Ottawa secured in one of the early CFI competitions? Who knew that that would lead to a 20 plus year, would go on to 25 years of relationship with the NRC? in working together, putting that instrument uh, that served uh, the whole of the academic community in the country at the NRC for strategic reasons or for opportunity or for crisis that we had to fix. Uh, it was the latter, of course, um, because we would have had to knock down a bunch of walls and ceilings to put that instrument in one of our campus buildings. So we said, well, maybe it would make a lot of sense to put it at the NRC, and we did. And it turned out to be one of the longest standing kind of federal government academic partnerships by a, a CFI uh, funded uh, initiative. And today, not only is the NRC and the academic community, but Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, Natural Resources Canada, Environment and Climate Change Canada are all actively using that instrument 20 years after it was first commissioned. Um, you talk about useful life, and all of those partners are continuing to contribute uh, to its expansion uh, in terms of functionalities, in terms of partnerships. And really, it is a, uh, an exemplar of when you create an environment where people's ideas can connect. Some of you may know that Stephen Johnson, uh, where uh, Ideas and Innovation Comes From, his, his book, um, it really is a testament that we can do things well. And yeah, over the 20 years, we've had to figure out processes that were clunky, um, different uh, regimes around uh, intellectual property, access, all of those things that Duncan mentioned. Um, but it's still going strong, and it can't it can happen. Um, I, in my role, have to break a few eggs every couple of weeks because when you talk innovation and partnerships, Quite often, they're quite novel and quite uh, unique. So as you know, academia loves precedence, loves stability and consistency and uh, uh, making sure that things are um, uh, normal. And I spend my days and my team uh, spends its days uh, working in the abnormal. And it, uh, 
um, is a uh, the, the, probably the most important lesson is that innovation can be really hard, but it's really worth it. And these partnerships that we've created uh, over the last uh, decade and plus with uh, federal departments uh, have transformed the university. Thanks, Guy. I think the term constructive disruption comes to mind and the need for win-win relationships. Um, instead of asking what should we do together, we should be asking maybe what problem do we want to solve together and how can we each contribute to that solution. So our last polling question was interested in knowing, according to you, what is the most important aspect of institutional partnerships? And that looks like a, a fairly even-ish distribution with understanding each other's ultimate objectives being the most um, endorsed response, shared values, I think, uh, executive level commitment, and institutional resources for operationalization. It looks kind of multifactorial to me. I think that you really do need the winning formula. So thank you very much for sharing those stories. I'm wondering if our audience has stories based on the fact that most of you raised your hand that you were both in the academic and the federal partnership space. I'm guessing that any of you could be panelists, not to detract from the excellent testimonies and ideas that we've had here, but sure, yeah. Why don't you come up to the mic just so we could hear you. There's a mic over there, a mic over here. And maybe just introduce yourself and then either share your comment, your question, your story. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Stephanie Haustein. I'm an associate professor at the University of Ottawa and I'm actually researching scholarly communication. I heard a lot of things, so my question is going in the direction of a lot of things I heard during the panel, which was really excellent, thank you. So I'm wondering, um, we all agree that collaboration, especially between federal government and academic science is beneficial, or that's what we're hoping it is. And I'm wondering how certain policies affect it. And very specifically, I want to ask the government, federal government scientists, have the great open, open science roadmap. So they're supposed to publish and share data and work as openly as possible and as um, close as necessary. Um, and that is great. Um, that is a big behavior change in how we do research. And especially in academia, open science is not yet valued. And as um, Guy mentioned, actually academia is very slow. <laughs> so changing takes a lot of time. And if a professor wants to get tenured, what is looked at is publishing in prestigious, high impact um, publications. And often those are closed. Data sharing is great, but it takes a lot more resources. So I'm actually wondering what happens if um, federal scientists collaborate with um, people in academia and those policies in particular respect to open science do not align. Does that mean in the end that you know, it's holding federal scientists back because the partners in academia do not want to maybe share data or publish open access? Or is it helping the universities to move forward? So I was wondering if you have stories to share about this implementation of open science in particular. Thanks, that's a great example. Does anyone want to tackle that one? Maybe just a few thoughts. Uh, one, we know that uh, the U.S. government has uh, introduced in 2025 a significant change around uh, publicly funded science uh, or research. So that's going to be a game changer. Um, we, we do have a secret weapon in universities around um, these different uh, parallel processes and, and regimes around uh, sharing and IP and uh, um, transfer of, of, of assets. And that's called adjunct professorships. So that's been the secret sauce for the university uh, when we talk about the Joint Center for Extreme Photonics with the NRC. Seven of the NRC members in that, in, in that consortium are all adjunct professors at the university, giving them, um, uh, you know, having two ways of seeing, which is both as, as a government scientist, but also as a university professor. So that's been extremely helpful. Uh, it's a tool that we use regularly. Um, when you want to make things work, 
you can find ways of doing it. Uh, we know, and Duncan, I'm sure, can talk about the number of stories that uh, Laboratories Canada have seen from where things have, have broken down because of the lack of clarity on, on sharing um, the limitations and the boundaries around how that works. So a student that's in a, uh, an academic lab that's working on the right side in a university setting moves over to the left side, which is a government setting, and all of a sudden, all the work that's being done there, the IP regime changes just because they've crossed two tiles on the floor. So those things have to be settled and understood to start, which when I go back, the, the comment was, the first thing you need to do is really understand, listen, co-develop, and take your time so that there's clarity in how that partnership's going to, to develop individual to individual, but also institution to institution. And when I talked about that layer above, you know, the 25 professors that are uh, working in collaboration with the CNL, um, you know, each of them might not have thought about um, data sharing, material sharing, uh, the role of the student that goes back and forth. But as institutions, we'll be able to do that and kind of put that layer above so that, you know, every professor is not spending an enormous amount of time trying to figure things out or the government scientist. So that's the value add of having that umbrella kind of um, uh, layer around things like open science, things like IP regimes, which you saw uh, nobody touch, but uh, believe me, they become huge uh, obstacles very quickly when people don't understand each other. Thanks, Guy. Um, I do have good news for you. Uh, I sit on a number of councils, and I could tell you that in the last month, the granting councils have been speaking with universities about implementation of their open data action plans. So within the next few years, universities will not be able to receive um, federal money if they don't have in place an action plan for how researchers will post and share their data. So I think that that's going to be a bit of a lever. And I could also tell you that within government, again, I'm only at Health Canada. Maybe I shouldn't be. I don't see why I can't share what's discussed at these tables because it affects you. Um, Health Canada, too, is actually looking at its data sets. And there's an inventory of how many data sets they have and how many are openly uh, published on the government open portal. And we're going to be accelerating because there's an implementation plan for the roadmap for open science and government, too. So like any change management, theory of innovation, behavior change strategy. It sounds like you're an early adopter. It, it sounds like you're out there doing it. 25% of us are going to be that way. 50% are going to need the nudges from the institution. And there's always going to be 25% who are going to argue it's confidential business information or proprietal information, sometimes justified, sometimes not. But there is an evolution going on. And fundamentally, at the end of the day, if you look at the guidance for research assessment that NSERC published, recently, I think we're looking to redefine, um, not redefine, sorry, that's a bad word, expand our concept of research excellence to include some of the behaviors that we think contribute to excellent research sharing, knowledge generation, and knowledge application to solve world problems. And my um, prediction, and I think there's very narrow confidence you know, intervals around it, is that within the next 10 years, we are going to see a sea change in um, the value and recognition that's given to data sharing, open data, and to those who subscribe to this expanded definition of where we need to be. So skate to where the puck's going, and um, I think things will change. Go ahead. Well, thank you. I, as your polling showed that climate change is one of the big issues, and that's why I'm going to talk about that. Uh, briefly, my, my name is Gordon McBain. I'm a former Assistant Deputy Minister in Environment Canada, responsible for climate science in the 90s, and before that I was an academic, and since then I've been an academic. So uh, let me just say, I wanted to talk about two examples uh, to bring them up of things that are very positive in this sense. One of them is the uh, in the 90s when we were trying to expand, when I was in my role as an ADM, I wanted to put more, of, build the linkages between my acad the academic scientists at universities in climate change with the government scientists I had in my own laboratories. And by, in this case, started co-locating them, putting government scientists into labs on university campuses. And one of the most successful ones was at the University of Victoria 
and there is then created uh, a enough momentum to create the Pacific Climate Impacts Consortium, which is probably one of the world's leading groups on climate modeling, but co-located with them is the Environment Canada. I just looked up on the website to make sure I have the name, new names from 20, that what they are now 20 years later, is the Canada Center for Climate Modeling and Analysis has teams of scientists in various labs, but a big group of them at the University of Victoria co-located together. And one of the conditions I made with the University of Victoria when we first moved people there in the 90s was that I wanted my government scientists to become adjunct professors so they could both have graduate students teach, inform, work together closely as an integrated team. And that's been, a, I think, a very successful story. Um, another one related to climate change that I, in this case, I did this entirely in my academic career, uh, was in the, around 2010, the International Development Research Center, jointly with the Tri-Councils, put out a call for research proposals, and I got funded for two and a half million dollars to look at coastal cities at risk due to climate change, where half of the money would go to support teams of researchers, in this case in the cities of Bangkok, Manila, and Lagos, three different countries, and the Canadian city of Vancouver. We wanted mega cities on the coast and on river deltas so we could bring teams together of scientists, both from the Canadian team, and we had teams of professors from, well, academics and, non and government people from various labs across Canada, including a healthy guy from Health Canada, uh, Peter Berry. Yay, Health Canada. And uh, I just threw that in so you'd smile and laugh. And, uh, but anyway. You got me. Yeah. I think that was one of, the, to me, one of the most successful and interesting projects I've been involved with, working together with these teams and having people in, for example, particularly in Manila team, explaining the issues as how they were trying to deal with them and how we could use those ideas and we could also tell how we're doing with a similar problem, say, in Vancouver, and learn from each other and move it ahead. I made a strong recommendation a few years later after that project ended in 2015 that they should, IDRC should do that with you, the Tri-Councils, again and again on other issues. And as far as I know, it's never happened again. Mm. And I think that's unfortunate. Then we should see how we could not only, because working globally with these programs, and if you're not aware, you know, the, well, the Prime Minister is now the leader of the global advocacy group on the SDGs, or co-lead with the, anyway. Um, and I think that Canada could work very closely with them through these kind of joint funding projects where we bring together uh, the scientist teams from various parts of the world in developing countries in particular, the ones that most impacted, and with the government, with the academic and government labs in Can Canadian teams. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on that and how we could let's say, reactivate some of these ideas and uh, spread out the ones that were successful into new initiatives involving, and if I put my last plug in, it is so essential with the climate change issue that we deal with all the disciplines together. The issues of health, I mean, the major issue is mental and physical health in terms of climate change. We see the, you know, the disaster of a building falling over in a flood but the mental health impacts on the people who lived there, on the poor people who had nowhere to live other than a box that was on the edge of a river, is just so tragic. And when you go to a place like Manila or Lagos and see what is happening, it is just overwhelming personally. Uh, so anyway, I just want to suggest that, there, that we could come up with some ways of doing this in a more enhanced way that could bring together the expertise that we have across communities and different groups from countries around the world. Thank you. Thanks for sharing those examples. I think that there were a lot of lessons learned in there. Um, do our panelists want to comment? Are you waiting for a question? Okay, maybe do our panelists want to comment or, or just say yes, we agree? <laughs> Shannon? I'll say yes, we agree. <laughs> um, yeah, and maybe, uh, I mean, most uh, of the commentary here has been focused on kind of domestic collaborations, uh, but your your point about uh, the value in international collaborations uh, 
is absolutely worth stating. Um, certainly at the NRC, um, we see the value in uh, international partnership and uh, similar to what uh, Guy and Jeff have been talking about, about uh, kind of taking those to a strategic level is something that we're looking at on the international front. Uh, so the NRC has collaborated internationally um, uh, probably since its inception. Um, and, and many of those collaborations um, have come out of uh, academic relationships is maybe the way that I would say them. And uh, they've, they've been fruitful very often, uh, but one-offs. Um, and so we are trying to uh, build some strategic international partnerships in uh, targeted areas where we believe that we have the, the kinds of synergies that we've been talking about leveraging uh, nationally. So, so yes. Thank you. There certainly are examples. Uh, the Healthy Cities Initiative through CIHR um, required researchers to partner with municipalities. Uh, there is the Canada Research Coordinating Committee um, and I think you should go speak to them to try to maybe bring forward some of these ideas for a future grant. So I think I see two more people with questions and we have maybe five more minutes. So I'm gonna go to you and then over there and then we'll wrap it up, go ahead. Well, thank you so much, I'll be quick. Um, first of all, thank you for such an insightful session. Uh, I especially liked your comment, Duncan, about the slowness of the process and the partnership, getting it. Um, another question that I had, and I kind of got curious because I'm an, I was an academic researcher and now I'm a public servant and I've seen research cultures in almost both of these sectors. And I kind of feel that the culture is different. For example, in academia, there is a pressure to publish or pressure to meet deadlines for your grant and you know pressure to deliver. I don't see that kind of pressure with, of course, the uh, federal uh, scientists. So. Most of the times, academic researchers are sort of running a race against time, which is not the case with the federal researchers. And there can be other different cultural aspects of uh, you know, how the science is conducted within academia and within federal science. And I know that you touched on the cyclical nature of academia versus you know, the federal research. But I was curious if you've ever seen a clash of cultures being a barrier for the partnership? Has it affected the partnership uh, or the, um, the possibility of a partnership negatively? And if yes, what are the strategies which were taken to uh, you know, counter these uh, kind of issues? Thank you. How to reconcile federal research culture and academic research culture? You know, one or two tips, who wants to take it? Go for it, Guy. I try to. I try to avoid clashes by preparing interactions. And so um, some of my colleagues who might go into uh, explorations for collaborations might have a very clear idea of what they want out of that collaboration. And it may be very wrong. Uh, or uh, it might be very poorly received. So part of my job, part of the, my, my team's job, and everybody that, uh, that, that, that is my, I call them my innovation machine, uh, are all relationship builders and are extremely good listeners. And you've all heard this before, but they are extremely good at translation. So translating between those two cultures so that we minimize the opportunities for friction and clashes. Um, the last thing we do is ask for money. We say, here's, a, here's our expertise. What are some of the challenges you're facing? And maybe together we can make a dent in some of these wicked problems and we can help Canadians, we can help Canada, and to Gordon's point, we can help uh, the world and other economies uh, because we know that uh, you know, what we're doing now is, is no longer local but global in, in scale and, and in application. So it really is about preparing, preparing, preparing and curating conversations so that we align and converge very quickly. Um, sometimes you think you've prepared your, your colleagues well and they surprise you, positively or negatively. And so that reality always exists. But if you build on a basis of trust and uh, goodwill and integrity in terms of what we want to achieve together, um, you tend to minimize those, those, those clashes. Doesn't mean they don't exist or that the challenges and the barriers don't exist, 
but at least you walk in with eyes wide open. I think that's fair. I think that there should be two questions at the beginning of every partnership that should be included in the long list of questions. One is what are we trying to achieve? And the other is what does success look like for you, both professionally and personally? Because everyone's gonna say, oh, this is a great idea, I wanna find the solution. Yeah, but at the end of the day, what is your performance management agreement, which is actually kind of like what you have to, you know, it's sort of like your promotion uh, dossier, but in government, are, are you a res, a research scientist in government? Are you a non-research scientist? If you're a research scientist, then probably publications are exp are important. If you're a non-research scientist, then probably delivering on your ADM's policy mandate um, is going to be important. And for each party to understand what do you need from this and what's your timeline, and what do I need from this and what's my timeline at the beginning of any partnership, it's about empathy, it's, it's about motivation, and I think those are you know, difficult, awkward, sometimes uncomfortable conversations, especially in Canada where we're so polite, but maybe we just need to say, let's put it on the table. Like what's gonna make you ecstatic through the roof in a year from now that you're gonna get out of this both personally and professionally? And maybe then we could start having those conversations and avoid the clashes, as you said. Last question over here to wrap up the session. No pressure. No pressure, okay. Uh, my name is Stefan Leslie and I'm with Research Nova Scotia, so I didn't put my hand up for either of the two categories at the beginning, because I work at the provincial level. Now, Research Nova Scotia is not part of the provincial government. We have the enviable position of being an independent organization, but of course we get our funding from the province. And I think the Canadian federal system is actually one that's comprised of multiple levels of government. And this issue is not one of simply integrating the federal order of government and optimizing its investment with the academic sector, but finding ways to mobilize the interests and the contributions of multiple levels of government. The provinces, although I don't work for the province, are in many respects responsible for delivering policies and services to, that Canadians depend on every day. It's the provinces that are generally guiding how climate adaptation is occurring, transportation policy, infrastructure decisions, healthcare, education, and so on. And I think that as a possible way to address the partnership model, provinces can certainly help define the problem space that could then be the subject of uh, different partnerships. But we're also here to contribute. We are funded, we fund research, we fund research infrastructure, projects, people. We have incredible flexibility on where that money goes. We don't have a color of money problem. And so engaging in true partnerships with the province can actually enable a much broader and I think ultimately much more satisfying research effort when you mobilize the capacity of each level of government. Thank you. Thank you. That is just a fabulous note to end on. Here, here. If I were going to be a change agent, or as Elder Valerie has told me, change warrior is the expression that she's taught me, I would propose that next year we change the title of this, this um, panel to national partnerships and international partnerships equal success. So change the words around, move the uh, bar, set it a little higher. Thank you to our panelists. Can I get a big round of applause? Merci beaucoup, thank you for sharing. This is part of the conversation, but a conversation that hopefully will lead to action and accountability, be part of the change. And we hope to see you tonight. The reception, are you gonna come tell us when the reception starts and all the partying and all that stuff? Or, that's where partnerships happen too, right? Although that's culturally inappropriate. Partnerships can happen without the wine and without the party and everything. I just wanna say that. So um, the reception starts at 5.15 in the Shaw Center, which can be accessible by a bridge on the second level if you don't wanna go outside. So you can take either the elevators or the escalators to the second level. The bridge is somewhere that way. There's a map on the, in the app if you can't figure it out, um, but I believe the masses will lead you. Uh, the dinner itself will be at uh, 6.15 now. It got moved up a little bit. So the reception is a bit truncated and then there's gonna be a mass migration up. And there is assigned seating, so you'll have to ask volunteers with our little blue badges where your seats are. And I believe there's also going to be the uh, seating posted around. So 
that's pretty much it. You can start making your way over.